What's up, everybody? Welcome to Move the Sticks. DJ Bucky with you on a Friday. Buck, how are you doing, man? Man, doing great, DJ. I uh, got a big football weekend ahead. We got these college games that are coming up. You know, the NFL is in full swing. And what I love about this part of the year when it comes to the NFL, man, down the stretch, this is when the stars begin to shine. But also when some of those unheralded rookies, rookies that we talked about, they begin to play prominent, prominent roles because injuries have put them into action and they got to make plays or the team won't win i've never asked you this question but I, i'm curious um i've been around teams i feel like i've seen this but i've not known it for sure but someone who's been inside the locker room you know you talk about this being a long season we use that phrase all the time mm -hmm. veteran guys did you see did you sense some of those guys that had kind of paced themselves and then now you got to this time of the year and now it's like okay this is the push you could kind of feel like okay now they they're raising it up a little bit in terms of of everything yeah no it, it's funny because there are a few different ways that those veterans kind of get it going right you'll see uh the teams try and preserve those players you'll see them take days off a practice they won't work maybe on Wednesdays and Thursdays they'll kind of show up on Fridays and Saturdays and kind of get their work in and then go play. Uh, you'll see them uh, take little leeways when it comes to like, I remember Marcus Allen, Hall of Famer Marcus Allen. We played together <laughs> in Kansas City. Uh, DJ, uh, 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 he practiced in these old school turf shoes that were, I mean, they're basically like basketball shoes, but on mm -hmm. grass. And so he's like, hey, man, got to have these easy walkers. Can't have my feet in these seven studs wearing my my, my dogs. I, gotta, I need them for later yeah. on. And it was such the classic vet move. But, yeah, they, they paced themselves. And the thing about it, and they always caution the young guys, hey, man, it's a marathon, not a sprint. You got to understand how to take care of your body. You got to understand, like, how to practice. You got to understand how to prepare, how to work out in the weight room and do those things. Because now you're getting down to the, the, the make the money time. Because everyone loves going to the postseason. Because postseason is not only a chance to chase that ring, it's some, some extra money, some extra cheese in your pocket. So everyone is trying to go after it. Yeah, I almost wonder though if you look at some of these teams that are you know riot, you know, riding some of these rookies. Houston is the team that comes to mind, not just the, obviously the quarterback and CJ Stroud, but Dell. And you think about the defensive yeah. side of the ball. I mean, they've got that's a lot of young guys playing. The, the uh, Green Bay Packers are playing a lot of rookies. Seattle's been relying on a lot of rookies. You know, the proverbial rookie wall is a thing, man. I I believe in that. I've seen that uh, in your history, having gone through it as a rookie. Buck, was there a moment where you're like, dang, man, I'm we still got four, five, six more games to go here. Well, think of it this way, DJ. I've always told young players, this is the, the first season, the rookie season, is the longest season that you'll have of your career. Let's go all the way back. So you finish your college season, January. You now got to get ready for the All-Star Games. You got to get ready for the Combine. You then got to go from training, from Combine to Pro Days to now, oh, I get drafted. I got to go ready for my, my first mini camp workout all season. I now get into training camp all the way through. When is the break for the young guys? See, veterans have had a little bit of the offseason to kind of chill, but there's been no chill for the rookie. So it's go, 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 go. At some point, the wall is going to hit. And so mm -hmm. all these teams that are playing all these rookies, you do wonder down the stretch when those older teams are ratcheting it up, they're turning up the intensity and the volume. Do the young guys have the capacity to give you just a little more? Can you squeeze a little more out of them or are they completely tapped out in gas? It'd be a huge difference. It could be deciding fact in which teams make the tournament, which teams are on the outside looking in. Yeah, we'll be keeping an eye on that. Uh, the rookies, you think sometimes young, fresh legs, that's a good thing. But like you said, they've just gone through an exhaustive process in the last calendar year. It has there's been no break. Um, so you know, we'll see how those guys make it through the uh the rookie wall here in the next few weeks. Um, Buck, we're going to hit on uh, the coach's corner here in a little bit, which uh, the word for today is creativity. Uh, we'll get to that in, in just a few moments. But I, I want to start out today. We haven't talked a ton of college football lately. We've got an interesting slate here. It's the last regular season game, and, and we've got some huge contests here that have uh, you know playoff implications. When you look at Oregon, Oregon State, that is 11 versus 6. Uh, Florida State, Florida, even though Florida's down, Florida State's now down a quarterback. You've mm -hmm. got Washington, Washington State. You think Washington, that's, uh, you know, they're going to be in the, in the Pac-12 championship game. They're two ends away from finding their way into the tournament here, into the final four. But the big one, and where I'd like to focus here, Ohio State, Michigan. Um, it's always big. And mm -hmm. now this thing is slanted towards Michigan. 
now you've got with all the Harbaugh and the sign stealings, Harbaugh is mm-hmm. not going to be in the mix. There's mm-hmm. all this talk swirling around that, wow, when this all gets out in in, uh, in the open, that Harbaugh could be suspended for all of next year. Not only do I think Michigan is a little better than Ohio State, Buck, I think that in some ways all this stuff is is going to work to their advantage of the kind of us against the world, whether, you know, mm-hmm. you agree on the severity of, of what they did. Um, but it is, it is, it is Michigan versus the world. That's, that's a fact. Yeah. Michigan versus the world here. Here's the thing. Uh, a game where the pressure was already on Ohio state coming in. There's even more pressure now. So now yeah, how do you lose this? They don't have, they don't have Harbaugh over there. How are you going to lose? Yeah. So, so now if Harbaugh's down on the sideline and you lose to them, I mean, that is egg all on your face. And what, what I wonder, and I'm looking to see how Ryan day does this. How does he take that pressure off the players? Because we all know if players are super emotional, if they kind of play with the weight of the world on their shoulders, they're not going to play at their best. Can he dial it back and kind of make it, I don't want to say a light week, but can he make it a lighter week on them mentally so they can show up ready to play? The robbery is already the robbery. It was already intense. It was already the only thing that people of these two respective fan bases talk about 365 days a year. But now it is... It is on and popping. You got that 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 smudge of scandal and all that other stuff. To the fact, Jim Harbaugh wouldn't even answer the question about whether he has respect for Ryan Day in the Ohio State programs. Ah, you know, it's, we're so entrenched in in preparing. <laughs> I can't even think about what's on the other side. Yeah. To me, DJ, that that says everything. I, I will say this though about Jim Harbaugh in Michigan, because I know there's been a lot of speculation about him maybe going to the NFL and them doing it. I love what he's done at Michigan. I think college football is better when he's at Michigan because everyone needs a villain. Right now, they're, they're the villain. Yeah. They're the villain. People don't like them, but the way that they play, the way they go on the road, the way they've been galvanized by the stuff that has taken place like the last couple of years, this is a really good team. It's a, it's a, it's a thorough blue blood program. Um, there's just something about them that you admire, and that's no disrespect to Ohio State and some of the other programs, but Man, they try to make themselves or remake themselves into the big boys where they can have a seat at the table with Georgia and Alabama and those teams. When you watch them play, they play like that. But now, can they play like that without Harbaugh in the building? That's what everyone wants to see. Can they get it done against Ohio State without big Jim Harbaugh on the sideline? Let me ask you this, because everybody said, let's fast forward. If Harbaugh you know, gets suspended, he gets suspended for a year, everybody's saying he'll go running to the NFL. Well, first of all, that's assuming that somebody wants to hire him. Can't go if they're not there. And everybody's just kind of assuming that that would be it for him at Michigan. And I'm sitting here going, like, wait a second, hold up. I saw Sean Payton get suspended for a year with the Saints. And they're like, well, we're not going to hire a coach better than Sean Payton. We'll, we'll wait it out. Like, just go take your year off and we'll be right back. But Buck, it would make the the kind of the legend of Jim Harbaugh in Michigan like he would never be. He'd be more popular than he's ever been if he stuck around there for a year and then came back. I mean, it would oh. be like the return of a king. I mean, not saying that's the right thing or the wrong thing. Well, I'm telling you, that's a fact. That's what it would well, be. Well, my thing would be if I if I'm him and them, we saw what it looked like before he got there. Yes. Are we sure we want to see what it looks like after he departs? Like. They have been a dominant team the past three seasons. If you think that it was just solely attributed to the sign stealing thing, cool. But I know when I watched them, they got man, NFL players. Man, they got NFL players. He got it popping. They're, they're, they have it rolling. They beat you up. They play a style that's conducive to being able to play against the Georgias and the Alabamas. Yeah, I wouldn't be so quick to move off of him permanently no. unless he's like, oh, I'm out. Uh, there's something to be said for what it looks like. And let's go back to his, his previous school, Stanford. Um, they were able to hold it together for a long time without him, but each and every year it, it changed the, the farther he was away from the program. Uh, I think I would, I would take a lesson from that. Yeah. You can win initially, but man, for staying power, long-term success, I think you have to have the Michigan man there. I would, I was what you said about Sean Payton. I would make that move. I would say, Hey man, like we get it. Take a year ago. A lot of world, go do whatever you want to do. But in a year, this is still yours. I mean, would you be surprised they gave him a contract? I mean, is it, it's it's funny to think of, but like, hey, you got suspended for a year. Well, just, hey, don't please take your time. We'll give you a new contract, a 10-year contract. You come back in a year, we'll pick up right where we left off. But in the meantime, for your for your troubles, for your vacation, here's a little extra for you. A little extra. And 
that offensive line coach, Sharon Moore, who, who's taken over, man, you talk about, I just love the loyalty and the stuff, how he expressed the gratitude and the appreciation for Jim Harbaugh. Hey, man, this is yours for a year. Like, take this, run it. We're going to be fine. You're, yeah. You'll do great with it. And it'll set you up for when you do eventually take it over, you'll be good to go. There, there's just so many things that would dissuade me from moving on from him, despite public pressure. I don't care. It's Michigan versus everything. <laughs> you know, Michigan versus everyone. I, I don't I, think any of their I, fans would be in a hurry to get him out of there. I think the fans would be sitting there going, like, do whatever you got to do. We'll wait a year. Come on back. Well, I mean, when's the last time? Like, they're back-to-back Big Ten titles. They've been in yeah. the college football playoff. They are uh, – people are talking about it. They're recruiting their tails off. Um, why would you want to move off of that? No, no, I'm with you. Uh, that'll be interesting. Looking forward to that game again. A great slate of games. Uh, looking forward to the college football weekend. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We come back. It's uh, Bucky's Coach's Corner. We're going to talk about some creativity next. All right, Buck. Uh, this week, uh, we love doing this each and every week. Bucky's uh, Coach's Corner. We like to take a term, uh, a theme, and, and elaborate on it a little bit. Today, uh, the word of choice is creativity. Yeah, creativity is, uh, is interesting because this is the fine line that every coach has to kind of dance with. How creative do we want to be versus being complex and complicated? Uh, You want to be creative where things are fun, where you're giving uh, your team new and exciting things. You want to be kind of on the cutting edge of innovation, but you don't want to confuse them where it bogs them down. And I think a lot of us, in terms of our creativity, sometimes we're afraid to fully tap into it because we don't want to know what failure looks like when we're attempting to kind of push the envelope or, or go across that line. When I think about some of the best teams and coaches, head coaches who were not afraid to kind of uh, have a blank canvas and kind of paint the picture the way that they want it. Uh, the great ones are always willing to kind of go to the line and beyond the line to see how far they can push it, how great they can grade, how high can they uh, lead and lift their programs up. And so creativity goes a long way in that. Keeping it creative, trying to keep things new, trying to be innovative to keep your players engaged while also sticking to the core principles that you have that have made the program successful. I think a lot of people would, would hear that and say, okay, are, are they at odds? Is like routine and discipline at odds with creativity? Mm. <laughs> because you sit there and say, okay, well, you got to have your, you got to have your values. You got to have your beliefs. You got to, ha- you know, we always talk about the menu, right? If you're uh-huh. putting in an offense or a defense, we want, we were more fans of the in and out menu uh, versus yeah. the, the, you know, the, uh, cheesecake, what, factory. cheesecake factory yeah there you go that that menu so it's having a core group of things you do really well but i think of to me when i think of discipline and and you know not what we've seen this year but over the course of bill belichick's run in new england you would if you're going to say you know a routine discipline buttoned up outfit that would be the example but i can i can remember seeing double passes with with julian edelman i can remember seeing some trick plays here and there i remember seeing game plans defensively get totally Mm -hmm. shaken up and them doing stuff they'd never done before go back and you know watch Mm -hmm. their super bowl against sean McVay. how they how they changed up their defense in that game i think they've married that pretty well with the discipline and the creativity it's funny because a few weeks ago we had Mike Norville on and uh, Florida State coach was, was was talking about a bunch of things. But I happened to see a clinic that he was leading and he talked about creativity and he used two words. He said same as. So the creativity comes as we talk about conceptual learning. So there's a concept that we like. Well, how many different ways can we get to the same concept while mixing formations, mixing personnel groupings? But it's the same as this concept for the quarterback, but it's different for everybody else around it. I think the key to being creative is trying to find that 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 link between this is what we always do. We're just getting to it a little differently. Uh, I'm around Doug Peterson each and every week with the Jacksonville Jaguars, but I go back to the work that he did with the Philadelphia Eagles and helping Nick Foles play at a Super Bowl level. DJ, they ran the same concept. It was the mesh shell across a million different ways Mm -hmm. but every week they just change the look to me the creativity is not the amount of plays or the different things that you do is how many different ways can we do the same thing (laughs) but just change the picture for what the opposition is looking at how about for learning um coach in high school you're a teacher you're teaching these guys is there creativity in the learning part let's go like off the field install helping these guys learn an offense or a defense or a scheme. Is there a creative way to do that? Oh, I think there's a very creative way to do it. And I think I've been blessed to be around a bunch of great 
like teachers, like real high school, middle school, elementary teachers that kind of helped me along the way. And they're always like, hey, man, it's no different than when you have kids and your kids are going from crawling to walking to running. And so, DJ, I believe this is applicable when it comes to dealing with pro athletes. OK, so first you show it on the board, then you show it on tape and then you go outside and then you walk through it and then you run it on bags and then you run it again uh, against live bodies. Um, you have to be creative and adaptive to the people that you inherit and that you're teaching. You have to know where they are and where they're at and how they need to get the message. So some years you can do it like, hey, I'm going to tell you what to do and you guys can go do it. But other years is, hey, let's walk through it. Let's walk through it with bags. Let's walk through it with people. Let's do it half speed, three quarter speed, full speed. How many different ways can I show you this until it finally clicks and you get it? A lot of what coaching is, is being creative uh, to see if you can meet the kids where they are. That has been, I think, the biggest challenge in terms of coaching high school ball and coaching youth sports is trying to take all this stuff that you may have in your head, all the complex things that you have in the head, the stuff you've been exposed to and trying to whittle it down to the essence of here are the main things that you need to know when it comes to this. I'll try and make it as simple as I can for you. And so I'm going to be creative in teaching it to you so that you can get it. One of the things I saw the other day, I don't know if you came across this. We we have talked on here. We talked about it, gosh, five, six years ago. We we talked about uh, virtual reality and how you can use that to help in the learning process. Quarterbacks mm -hmm. done it. They did it at Stanford. I think that's actually where it started. Um, but at LSU, there was a thing on Jaden Daniels, a little story on him, and it showed, uh, I think it was uh, Marucci, Jack Marucci, who's been there at LSU. Mm -hmm. He's you know, interesting guy. I mean, he's launched the bat company, baseball bats, yeah. baseball bats, but he's been, uh, he's been in that LSU program forever. Uh, and he, I think was key in, in, in getting this instituted there, but talked about how since Jaden Daniels has been using that, how much that's helped him because you're just getting, you talk about mental reps, oh, mental reps. Okay. Close your eyes. You no, put the goggles on. You can get, you can get, you can sit at home and get hundreds and hundreds of reps versus the same plays versus different mm -hmm. coverages and where your eyes go, what you see, you know, to me, we've talked about that for a long time, and I think if people dabble in it a little bit here and there, but I've yet to hear somebody say, you know, when I did that, it didn't really help. You know, it wasn't really <laughs> helpful. Like, yeah. Another example of being creative. No, being creative, uh, I was lucky when I was in college, uh, there was a sports psychologist around our program called Dr. Richard Coop, and the night before games on Friday nights, we would play on Saturdays. Uh, he would sit us in the room. He would sit a handful of us. I was always in there with the kickers and punters. And we would nice. go through visualization, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's all right. You kind of like lull you to sleep, but then you would visualize how the game would play out. And DJ, I can't tell you how many deja vu moments you have on the field when you kind of go through that process. And I just remember being exposed to that stuff at an early age. My dad was a big believer in like, hey man, play the game in your head before you actually play the game. It actually yeah. slow it down and those things. And the virtual reality stuff is just that on ten. It is allowed uh players to play the game in their mind without having to go through the physical rigors but your mind can't tell what's real or imagined and so the reps are ingrained it still matters you still develop um those skills from going through it uh it, it's something that you would think more people more teams more players would take advantage of because when i look at what Jaden daniels has done there's no doubt he is a much better and a much different player than he was at arizona state he is yeah. a night and day difference. Brian Kelly, all the other stuff that they've done at LSU has certainly helped him become, I would say, a very viable uh, prospect, quarterback prospect for a team looking for a leader. And he's probably going to win the Heisman Trophy the way he's been going here, too. Uh, add that to his mantle. But uh, I always, I've told this story before, but in terms of creativity, teaching, um, coaching, I go back to when I was a freshman, a redshirt freshman at Northeast Louisiana. Our coach was Ed Zombreaker, who'd been around for a long time, been the coordinator at the LSU, I believe, at Florida. Before that was uh, was it, uh, where else was he at? I think he was at Purdue. But uh, he would take the quarterbacks the day before the game, and we would walk onto the field. So say there's five of us. Yeah, yeah. remember we've told you this. We start at the we start at the goal line and say, okay, we've just been pinned deep. We got the ball to our two yard line. What's our thought process here it's a first down we just want to get one first down we want to give our punter room we're going to be safe with the football we're not going to you know we're going to take what's there we're probably going to you know if we throw the ball probably going to be in the flat it's going to be safe to the outside safe throws one first down that's what we're thinking okay let's move on okay we're at the 20 
This might be where we start the game, first drive of the game. You know, here's the play, here's our play sheet, what we're going to start off with. Boom, 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 boom. Then we get to midfield. Okay, we're at midfield. Hey, we just got a turnover. We're at midfield. We're going to take shots here. These are the three plays we like. Which one do you guys like the best? You know, if you're the starting quarterback, we get to make that call. I prefer this one, this one, then that one. Okay, we got them in that order. We're going to take this shot here. And we would march all the way down the field. Hey, we're in field goal range. No turnovers. We're safe with the football. We've got three points. You know, da 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 da. da. I mean, it was just. And then you'd find yourself in the game and you're like, okay, yeah, no, I've already kind of gone through all this. And just walking the field, instead of just saying it in the classroom, it made it sink in. D DJ, I'm going to give you a little secret sauce, right? So I told you before that I uh, coached the varsity team, but I also coached the JV team. So yeah. the JV plays right before the varsity. So I've always coached both units. Um, I have guys that work with me. They do a lot of the heavy lifting, but it, there was a time where I would call the offense for the JV and the offense for the varsity. One of the things that we've always done with the JV team is like, I, you know, that we practice at 6 a.m. before school. Well, yeah. one of the things that we've done with the JV program is they go Monday through Thursday. The JV is on one side, varsity on the other. But on Fridays, it's kind of like the special little walkthrough practice um, with me and the JV team. And what we do in the morning, DJ, where a lot of people go through a walkthrough, we basically have like a real practice at 6 a.m. the day of a game. And mm -hmm. that practice not only encompasses like, hey, we'll tackle, we'll do all the other stuff. Now, we're not in pads, but we'll go through it. But we'll go through the entire warm-up, like how are we going to do pregame warm-up? How are we going to shake hands at the end of game? How are we going to mm -hmm. take a picture at the end of the game? And so when you are talking me through that scenario where your coach would take you one by one by like down the field and kind of walk through situations or whatever, there's a saying where people say the game is overcoached but undertaught. What your coach did is he taught you in a creative fashion how to play the game. And I remember I'm taking notes here about that. Like, oh, man, that's a that's a that's a tactic that we can use. We can walk the, the team through these scenarios and make sure that everyone is on board because look, practice is really a dress rehearsal for what the game is going to be like. And the closer you can bring that dress rehearsal to the game, the more likely your teams are going to respond in the fashion and the manner in which you want to respond. Mm -hmm. No, no doubt. I mean, again, you could expand it beyond, beyond the quarterbacks to the point where even like, hey, you know, this is a, you got a fast kid on your team, and and hey, when we get to this part of the field and this part of the game, this is when you're coming in. You've got your, you know, your little package. We're going to use you here, but like, just help those kids see it. They see it before they do it. It makes it easier. And the more you do it, man, the more comfortable they get. And so when you get in the games, you're able to on the sideline. Hey, guys, we. We talked about this. We, we did this in practice. We talked about this morning. Hey, we're just going to do exactly what we did this morning. What are we going to do? Oh, okay, coach. We did. Oh, yep. Here we go. Let's go. Let's go run it. Um, yep. That's what it is. No doubt. Um, all right. That was a good one today. Bucky's Coach's Corner. Enjoy that each and every week. Uh, it's been a fun week, Buck. We were able to get five in uh, with the holiday as well with Thanksgiving. Hope you guys have all had a, a wonderful week. Hopefully a little downtime. Recharge your batteries a little bit. Um, and all set up for a great weekend of football, which we will recap on Monday uh, right here. So join us again next week. We'll have five episodes for you as we do each and every week during the season. We appreciate you, uh, and we'll see you next time right here on Move the Sticks.